it's not something, an era, it's not a fun topic of conversation yet for people. It's not like people st share their war stories so much yet mm. about the AIDS era, at least in my social circles. Um, you know, no one had ever asked me, the, the book came about because no one had ever asked me what it was like. And Brontes Purnell said, what was it like when everyone started dying? And I was like, uh, you know, I'd never articulated it before. Um, I think I said something, oh, it was scary. I uh, didn't like it, you know, it was, I didn't yeah. have an answer ready because no one had ever asked. So, and the, and like literally the night after he asked that question, I started the book. Wow, that's so heavy. That is so heavy to think about that, that we're, uh, you know, walking around having experienced that and not talking about it with anybody. Yeah. Although, you know, I think about my parents' generation and well, right. what they went through, like- They didn't talk about you anything, know, right? <laughs> you know, pogroms in Russia, they didn't mention it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the old country. Ugh, you know, we right. don't talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the ACT UP crew is sort of the opposite of that. That This is a group of people, you know, the ones who have survived and are still around, are all on social media together and all talking about it all the time. <laughs> so it's always the opposite problem, the pressure to sort of represent a time that means so much to so many people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and yet still, even for all the things that have been written in the movies that are starting to come out and so on, um, there's still a way this history isn't, talk, isn't talked about. The silences you're talking about, Alvin, and, mm -hmm. and just the general way in which queer history isn't really taught to, to young people. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a, there's a lot of urgency around like the story being told right. And a lot of people who sort of feel like they have ownership of the story. And, and uh, it's, a really, it's a really fascinating thing to, to, for this community to still be, you know, the, still be at it. I mean, I got most of my information about COVID from the the former AIDS activists, some of whom are still in, in in treatment issues, a lot of whom are public health people now or have gone into, you know, professionalized fields that grew out of that experience with AIDS. Those were the people I was getting all the information about COVID from, you know. So the the that 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 crew, those people um, are are still at it and still talking about it. But I think the thing you're talking about that's so that's so beautiful is that the personal silences are still there, right? It's easy to talk about the policy or about the yeah. fights for one, right. but, um, but what about that night when, you know? Mm -hmm. But it, 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 I have been getting a lot of stories since the book came out. People have been calling me up and telling me new stories. And, and so, you know, my publisher's listening. I will do an extended, extended remix. I will yeah. throw 40 pages of, of interesting stuff <laughs> for the, for the <laughs> edition. Like Marguerite Dura, you'll just write the same story there again as another book, you know, just <laughs> we'll all buy it again because we love this one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so shall we do the, the lightning round of questions, Beth? Oh yeah, I wanted to just do a little bit of a getting to know you quick quiz with uh, Alvin because I just think it's, there's, it's just fun to sort of, it's sort of a Proust questionnaire style. I mean, I, but I did want to put on some music. I don't know if we'll be able to hear it um, as we just ask him a few, a few questions. Okay. <laughs> Alvin, if I were to make an Alvin Orloff art film that followed you around for 24 hours, who should I ask to compose the score? Mark Holman from Soft Cell. Oh, good answer. Alvin, which business establishment would you uh, visit first after everything reopens in San Francisco? Community Thrift on Valencia Street. Best thrift oh. store in town. Right. Speaking of thrift stores, which thrift store find have you had the longest? Well, I've been a thrift store addict since the age of, oh, 16. So I can't actually remember that far back, but this is maybe my best. This is a 3D image of a beautiful woman looking in the mirror on her vanity and it's suitable for framing. 
It's gorgeous. Does she have macrame around her wine goblet in the front there? What is going on? Uh, I think, yeah, I think it may, it may be a, a macrame perfume holder, perfume bottle holder. <laughs> okay, this is straight from the Proust questionnaire. On which occasion do you lie? If people ask me if I like their new haircuts, I always say, regardless of what I think, it's great. Because <laughs> once they've got their haircut, there's nothing they can do about it. Sure. Very, very smart. Uh, Alvin, if you had to make your living by selling a craft project on Etsy, what would that craft project be? I lack manual dexterity, so I think the only thing I could really do was glue googly eyes on pine cones and little felt noses and feet and like call them piney people and sell piney. Oh, I'm sure there's a market. Maybe you could learn how to do uh, macrame perfume bottle cozies for your future. That would be also a, 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 good, a good one, but I'd have to learn macrame. But I'd be up, up, I'd be up for it. Yeah. Um, two more questions. Name a memorable customer at the bookstore where you work. Well, this is a, this is a stereotype smasher. A woman in the burqa came in and went straight to the gay porn section and spent, oh gosh, maybe 45 minutes leaping through every piece of gay porn that we had. Incredible. Get rid of your stereotypes, just throw them out. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, in your book, you talk about how Tony vaguely got Lauren Bacall to write a letter to Diet when he was in the hospital. And I'm just wondering which legend of the silver screen would you want to receive a correspondence from in a time of crisis? I'm going to have to say Cary Grant because he's, his debonair energy is what you need in a crisis. You need someone who's got that je ne sais quoi debonair style energy. Uh, that's a good way to end it because I feel like you have that energy right now, Alvin. Oh, and we'll just do a play a little. Okay, that was just a little getting to know you questionnaire with Alvin Orloff. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well done, well done. All right. Thank you, Beth. Someone just, someone wants you to post your, your questionnaire so they can ask everyone those questions. Because <laughs> that is, that is, those oh. are window to the soul questions, window to I, the soul. Somebody else wants to see your whole apartment, as do I. <laughs> I can do like a Jackie Kennedy touring the White House sort of a. a uh, with just a voice, that really nice, just soft, very soft spoken. This is my couch. It's, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Someday. <laughs> So Beth, your book came out in the middle of the COVID crisis and you haven't been able to tour. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> I know. I, I know. So much. And I wish you could go on a great big tour and tell everybody. Um, I know. Have a I know. Well, do you remember? Yeah, I do. Remember, we were going to do this event in person. Right, when, right. when it first started, we thought, well, by June, it'll be fine. And <laughs> yeah. I'll come out to San Francisco and we'll do right. the event in person. Um, I know we were wishful thinking, but yeah. Um, yeah, this is my new book. It's called Edie on the Green Screen, and it's a novel. And um, uh, yeah, and I, you know, I'll be out. I get come out to San Francisco a lot during the normal time. So we'll see whenever I can get. Yeah. Uh, you know, who knows? Twenty twenty one. Here's hoping. <laughs> so one of the reasons I like that beer novel so much is because it's about someone who has to move on from a, a world, the, 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 let me put it this way, the, there's a Susie and the Banshees song called Your Parties Fall, it goes, Your Parties Fall Around You. And it is very much what happens to Edie, the main character in your book, and it's very much what happened to me when all my friends died all at once. And the scene that I was part of blew away, was gone with the wind. And so I'm wondering, um, it's, it's uh, the personal disasters, the way they link up with, with uh, national disasters is, is become an interesting thing for me. Um, yeah. And I'm not quite sure where I'm going with this question. Well, yeah, well, I think, I think it's interesting because I think in a time of a disaster with a personal disaster or national, international, global disaster, you, you are forced to look, or you should be looking inward and trying to figure out who you really are and what's important to you. Yeah. And I think that, that like we were talking about with, you know, your friends dying of AIDS and, you know, the city gentrifying people having to move, people leaving, that um, now in this time when we're all sequestered in our homes for the most part, and then wanting to go out in the streets and protest. And, you know, you, you have to, 
think about who you are without a lot of the external stuff and and what's That's important scary. to you so <laughs> outside of my social circle ah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah crisis and opportunity a crisisunity as homer since <laughs> <laughs> once dubbed it oh you didn't even have to attribute that to homer i would have thought it was you no it's homer <laughs> or whoever wrote Homer Simpson's dialogue. Um, I feel so unprepared. I, I don't have any Homer Simpson's quotes at my fingertips right now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the only one. Um, OK, let me think about some more things to talk about. Gosh. So uh, all right, this is an interesting thing. Um, Nostalgia gets a really bad rap these days. People hate the, the, the very thought of old people talking about the old days. People are very suspicious of that. It seems kind of sentimental and maybe escapist and self-indulgent. But I am sort of of the opinion that, that you can't really escape nostalgia if you're going to talk about history, if you live through it. And oh, that's interesting. I think you should talk about that, Carl, with, with that's, your, that's with your new book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Carl, I mean, a lot of people I know are nostalgic for the AIDS era because of the sense of community and purpose they had as activists. Have you that, encountered this? That is the ultimate, like, crazy nostalgic thing to say. It's like when I was young and people would say, oh, I'm nostalgic for the closet. You know, it was so much more interesting then. Now everything's just out there and in your face. It, it, it makes no sense at all, right? Like the worst, most painful epidemic where, you know, how many thousands of people, you know, in this city alone died and, you know, and then people are like, no, but you know, this happened and that happened and it's so much better than now. I mean, good Lord, if there's one thing people could just take off their nostalgia list, I would say, the AIDS epidemic would be one for starters. Right? And maybe people are just nostalgic for whatever happens when they're young. It doesn't matter. If you can be what, you know, Anzio, storming the beach at Anzio, but it doesn't matter because you were young. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think there's a difference between looking back and saying, you know, there were things that I miss or things that were better. But nostalgia sort of is, is I guess, just by its very definition, is supposed to kind of sugarcoat the yeah. sugarcoat all that, right? So it sort of just sort of feeds upon itself right away right unfortunately i think i'm congenitally prone to nostalgia i just have this pollyanna view of, of everything and mm -hmm. um I, I don't know that it's going yeah no it, i'm kind of nostalgic too a selective like um uh, like, a, like almost like a survival mechanism to block out the pain and like yeah, and, 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 and yeah I, I or have you ever seen the movie pollyanna with little Haley mills i mean <laughs> it's really good movie <laughs> I recommend it. Uh, um, it <laughs> someone wrote in the comments, nostalgic for my hair. Hi, Gary. Uh, <laughs> yes, that, I, that's a nostalgia I can definitely get behind. Somebody does want to know if we still love the city. Do y'all still love the city? Yes. I do. <laughs> Weirdly. Okay, here's why I still love the city. Because I don't know how they do it, but there's all these young queer people, LGBTQI, et cetera, et cetera, people moving to the city still, and they've still got great energy. And I, I don't think they're, they have lives as easy as it was for me or until, you know, before AIDS, you know, because they're, they're paying ridiculous rents and they've got to work really, really hard and something, you know, if you moved here in 1979, you didn't have to work that hard. But these young people with lots of energy and creativity are moving to the city and they're great to be around. I mean, I, uh, I love hearing that some young people at the store where I work and, and they're delightful. Yeah, yeah, the, I mean, I, I, I love the city. I live in Stoma. Um, I live right, you know, near, near, not too far from Civic Center or Sixth Street. And it's until this horrible pandemic and shutdown, it's been incredibly vibrant down here. You know, the stud um, being bought by this collective of 17, you know, people, most of them in, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, you know, and revamping it and all this new programming that got brought into that bar, you know, where suddenly there was like some, you know, their, their survival mechanism was to just do lots and lots of new programming. So there's this whole new wave of drag, you know, bands playing, you know, um, and, you know, just building off that great stud tradition of every part of our coalition, our queer, LGBTQIA allies all together, you know, just beautiful stuff. I mean, Wicked Grounds Cafe, the Kink Cafe, mm -hmm. you know, that that's like super trans positive space, like doing all this great kinky stuff and bring that whole dialogue up to 
stuff around consent. And there's so much cool stuff that's been actually going on like right here in the heart of the city. And um, I trust that San Francisco is always going to find that next generation that's going to going to be able to do it. You know, it's a direct line from what you're writing about in your book, Alvin, and you're writing about in your book, Beth, to these kids today. You know, they always show up. Who knows how? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I'm just the other day I was at a, uh, there was a <laughs> rally here in the mission, a, a Black Lives Matter rally, and it was organized by guess how old the people were who organized it? 17. And there oh, were like wow. 10,000 people. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. So. Yeah, the same one, same thing for the protests that shut down the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, which again, a direct lineage back to like the ACT UP, you know, days of, of, of protest organized by a 17 year old black girl from San Ramon, you know, yeah. like stop traffic on the Golden Gate Bridge because she yeah. got a protest together. I mean, that makes me still love San Francisco because the, the politics, the spirit, the, the grassroots, all of it. Yeah, I love all of yeah. that. Stuff. Well, I think that that's good too. It's a good counterpoint to the, the connotation of nostalgia being this, you know, things aren't as great as they used to be and things were better when, you know, it's like, it, it's, it's direct, you're having direct experiences with people who are younger, who are doing cool shit, who are there making mm -hmm. things happen in the same way that, you know, we all were trying to do when we were their age or, I mean, that, that makes me really happy because I haven't been around San Francisco as much. So I don't know about the young people. Of course, it's like, you just read about the, in the New York times, all the, you know, tech ruining everything and people love to complain about it, you know, and it's hard. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I basically had to write my book so that I could pl complain about it in a certain way because it was just hearing it everywhere and, and I was feeling it, but you don't, what, what are you going to do if all you're doing is complaining? And yeah. But you know, one thing about the universe loves to humiliate me. And so I complain, complain, complain about tech. And then this COVID thing comes in and I'm locked in my apartment and I'm so glad for all the technology. I'm so glad that we right. can have this. <laughs> Zoom. I'm so glad I've got the horrible social media that drives me crazy. I'm glad that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an irony, a sad irony yeah. that I've been <laughs> once again forced to, to bow down and say, yeah, tech has its points. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's interesting to me about it too, is like, it's often positioned as tech versus, you know, versus San Francisco right. or tech has destroyed San Francisco. But I know so many creative people who have jobs in tech and they are not the tech that you sort of always hear about, right? Like there's lots of incredible people who are creative, who need work and that that's where the jobs are. So I feel yeah. like the dichotomy of like tech killed San Francisco tech is just really simplistic. And I, for me, it always goes back to- Capitalism. <laughs> real estate, capitalism, you know, greed around land use. Like that to me is the real villain of, you know, that's the thing that's yeah. gonna kill this city. It's gonna be that shit. And it's horrible, but it's happening to every city. I don't think it's happening. I mean, we're just a little bit ahead on the curve, but it's so sad. I, you know, I, I did get to go to a few other cities on my, my book tour when the book came out. And, you know, Seattle, you know, same thing. You know, it's all yeah. the, 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 the nightmare of gentrification. is. Well. I'm glad we're all writing about the past so we can just like kind of focus on that and let the futurists tell us what's actually going to happen on the other side of this, because I... I I can't write that. We need Ursula Le Guin or someone like that. Yeah, right. <sighs> there is a question. Will we be better or worse when we emerge on the other side of the pandemic? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I think both. I think some things are going to be way, way better and some are going to be way, way worse. Um, I, I, I really, I think that the, the economic nightmare that the, it's been going on for like for me it's like 25 years this slow erosion of, of of security and just finding it more and more impossible to live um and people weren't really talking about it until like what 2008 the the what was the what was it the name of the group um what occupy occupy yeah came along and and then it sort of but now I think it's got that whole energy of wanting to redress the economic inequalities is getting a big boost from this. Because I mean, everyone's seeing that, you know, the corporations are using COVID as an excuse to loot the public treasury and throwing crumbs to everybody who is not part of the corporate elite. 
And I think that on the other side of COVID, I think we're, we're going to see some real class action, some real class conflict, and it's going to come out in the open again. Um, my, my prediction. Um, Take notes. Yes. Yeah. And for worse, I mean, gosh, we're all going to have to be really careful for a really long time because I don't think COVID is a once-off uh, yeah. disease. I think that humanity has pushed nature so far and it, we're, we're exploiting animals so horribly and so heavily that there are going to be more pandemics rooted in, what do they call it, zoo something or other. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't remember the exact word. Um, a lot more diseases are going to be jumping into the human species from all the animals we're mistreating. Let's talk about how we missed the 80s, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question up here. Uh, what would diet say about COVID, et cetera, if you were Zooming with us? <laughs> is the Diet Popstitute is the, uh, my, my great partner in crime who is the kind of centerpiece. He was my, my soulmate and centerpiece of the book, Disasterama, and he would find something really irreverent to say about it, but I can't quite think what. And you know, this is, this is one, zoonosis, Kevin Clark knows the word um, that I was looking for, for diseases. Um, but no, all right, back to diet. He would have something really irreverent and kind of disturbing to say, yeah, we had it coming, there we go. Yeah, I think the diet might very well say we had it coming. Um, uh, oh, Monique Jenkinson has a question. Memoirist, we had to change or delete anything because of people not wanting to be included. No, no one, no one told me, don't say it. What about you, Beth? Has anyone ever asked to, to be taken out of your writing? Mm, I'm trying to think. I don't think so. If they knew that I was writing, I don't think anybody said, I mean, my husband's great about it. I, I don't write about my kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never written about really uh, very specifically about my oldest brother who died five years ago, who had a, a lot of disabilities and I'm trying to write about him now. And, um, but I, that was more, that was more inferred that I, I realized that neither my son nor my brother would probably like to be written about while yeah. they're around and aware <laughs> of it. Yeah. I, I never write about my siblings, but um we're in good terms. I mean, I don't have anything bad to say about them, but I just haven't got around to them yet. Yeah, <laughs> got time. Yeah. Well, I think uh, earlier, I don't, I don't know if she's still here, but my younger sister was on this chat, so maybe I should uh, ask her how <laughs> a writer in the family who's always sort of thinly fictionalizing your family. <laughs> uh, uh, Monique, I, I, don't, I don't think I've been asked to change or been, been told to change by anyone I've written about. Um, but I have conversed, oh, there's Kim. Your first book was very interesting on that front. That's my sister. Yeah, when I created a family where the youngest child got killed off and here she is alive and kicking. So. Um, uh, I've done it because, yeah, like Beth was saying, inferred what would be the way to kind of handle it right. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. No demands. Another question, would we set our writing pre or post COVID if we were to start a new project right now? Would we want to write about? Oh my God. I have, I have something to say about this. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, because I've been working on a screenplay with my screenwriting partner, Aaron Cantor, and we started a script, uh, we had sketched it out last year at some point, but we really started working on it in earnest sort of right before shelter in place started. And we live in different cities, so we were doing everything remotely anyway. Um, and then it was a scene, it's a script set in the San Francisco nightlife and there was actually a scene set at the stud. And while we were writing it, the stud closed down. And you know, our whole goal was to be able to shoot a film in our community, about our community, and suddenly the venue itself was gone. And it really was a moment of reckoning that I'm not sure we've completely recovered from yet, where we've had to really think about, okay, is this a pre-COVID script where we talk, you know, we set this scene in the nightlife before nightlife went away for some unforeseen period of time, or are we trying to be futurists and imagine 
okay, this is set in 2021 or 2022 and this thing might actually get shot and what does it look like? And it's a real dilemma and I'm finding this with my, um, my students. I teach at USF and a lot of students are writing novels and they're trying to figure out like, if you're writing a contemporary story, where it feels like a real line in the sand, right? Because the reality is so different on either side. And I think it's so hard to, yeah. to really just trying to figure it out. Oh gosh. Yeah, I think I would have to write about pre-COVID because it takes me a really long time to, to know what I think about anything. Like I, I know what I think about the events that happened to me and my friends, you know, in 2015, yeah. 2018, I'm still, I'm still digesting it. It's just has a very slow brain. Yeah. And uh, we, have a, we have another couple questions here. Uh, what are or our favorite books as kids? Oh my gosh, the Oz, the Oz series. There are like 26 Oz books. L. Frank Baum wrote 14, and then Ruth Plumley Thompson wrote like 20, and just got, there's so many Oz books, and they were so great. What about you guys? Oh, man. I, I, read, I read all the Zilpha Keatley Snyder books when I was really little, but I, w I would take a lot of my mom's books off the bookshelf and read sex scenes, you know, <gasps> when I was very young. So a lot of Sidney Sheldon, a lot of, you know, um, uh, just she just she read everything Danielle Steele um, what are those books um, flowers in the attic that's all about like incest between siblings like, I just I read a lot of really weird wow. shit when I was little yeah 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 we my parents had a copy of uh, Jacqueline Suzanne's once yeah. is not enough that yes. ends, ends in an acid orgy and um, last year for Lintquake uh, there was, an, there was an event at the Green Arcade bookstore that was about pulp. And they, they wanted us to talk about the influence of pulp on our writing. And so I just went to Jacqueline Suzanne. I was like, it's more camp than pulp. <laughs> and I read the acid orgy scene at the Green Arcade bookstore. And it was really, really one of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to have to revisit that. <laughs> yes, it's, 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 the, pro, the protagonist is a girl named January who has daddy issues and winds up in an acid orgy. Yeah. Uh. It's one does. <laughs> yeah. um, there's another question now. Are there other San Francisco memoirs we recommend? Favorites? Um, uh, I'd say Michelle T's Valencia. I love, right. love that book. And there's a new one um, from uh, uh, Mark, Mark Hustis, uh, The Impresario of Castro Street. Oh, yeah, I haven't read that. Uh, a lot of showbiz type stuff. And, um, yeah. And, and Alia Volz has a new one about growing up in a family of pot brownie distributors. Oh yeah, called Home Baked. Home Baked, yeah. that's a great one. Yeah, I like Home Baked, it's really great. Home Another Baked is our next month on the same page. So oh, wow. Alia will be here. He's great. Um, what about self-censorship around memoir? Do you ever struggle with worrying about how people might react to your version of a story versus how they might remember it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do worry about it. I didn't actually encounter any any difficulties. No one telling. Well, no one. I, there was one one thing I attributed something. I don't. I won't say it because it's embarrassing. But um, to someone other than me. But I, I did um, attribute. Uh, a certain heroic act to somebody who didn't actually engage in a heroic act. Um, and I discovered it afterwards. But I don't really self-censor. Um, I just try to get it right. Um, and, uh, oh, and someone pointed out a new, a uh, really wonderful memoir of San Francisco, Fairyland by Alicia Abbott, which is oh, a yeah. must read about uh, a young girl growing up with her gay dad. And her gay dad is kind of a bohemian writer type in the new narrative movement and uh, that, that's a really great book fairyland yeah and i would also concur with oh the glory of it all sean wilsey's book. oh right i forgot that's mm -hmm. it get all the tea on miss dd wilsley honey i know don't miss it <laughs> and then of course pat montadon his mother wrote oh the hell of it all in response ah, so you, i never read her version read that one. Yeah, you can get we that did a we did a porch light show where we had both um Pat and Sean on the on the show it was fantastic. They both kind of told their versions, but yeah, yeah so she's amazing. So good. Mm. Uh, are you going to read from your book, Alvin? Is this time? Yeah, read from your book. 
Okay. All right, so I'm just going to read, um, because this is a time of protest and I want people to be able to kind of, I think we're all looking for new creative ways to protest. I'm just going to read this one little bit. Um, this is in the height of the ACT UP Queer Nation era, probably around 1992-ish or so. And um, <clears throat> example one, picture me writhing on the sidewalk outside of Macy's Union Square on Black Friday, while someone dressed as a can of Coors beer pretend kicks me, and someone dressed as a pack of Marlboros pretend clubs me with a cigarette. My friend Diet, who's the lead singer of the Popstitutes, the band I was in, sings the mugging, and earnest young activists hand out flyers urging a boycott of Coors and Marlboro for funding anti-gay politicians. Pedestrians ignored us as they rushed off to buy, for, buy gifts for Christmas. Example two, an evangelical preacher in the Sunset District publicly urges that gays should be put to death. So the Popstitutes joined the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence for a counter sermon. I brought along the Dayglow Orange Cross on which I had recently been crucified as a Playboy bunny uh, for an Easter show, and we produced some convoluted street theater outside the church. Theater is the only weapon available to the penniless and powerless, so we were doing the best we could, but alas, our little show was both inaudible and invisible to the congregants inside the church, which resembled nothing so much as a World War II bunker with stained glass windows and a spire that could have been used as a gun turret. Daya and I never discussed it, but we both knew that the giant corporations and religious zealots we were protesting barely noticed our existence. Such bogeymen lived in the real world, a place where theatrically expressed opinions by oddly dressed youngsters meant less than nothing. That our demonstrations didn't change a lot of minds didn't make them entirely useless, though. Sometimes you have to preach to the choir to make them sing louder. Plus, our ineffectual protests made us feel better, like kicking a cabinet door on which you've just banged your shin. And maybe, just maybe, by registering our objections to being reviled, we salvaged a bit of dignity. Whatever the case, protesting kept us busy, essential since we were young and incapable of sitting still. The end. Yay. Okay, let's hear from one of you two. Oh, do you want to, I, I feel like, Carl, you read, and then maybe there's more questions for Alvin. I okay. feel like, because, yeah. Sure, well, this would be a good segue because I'm writing about that same period. Uh, I'll be reading about that same period too. So this is from the, the, the novel about ACT UP that I um, was referring earlier. And uh, just a little setup here. So it's 1989, it's New York. There's a narrator and his boyfriend who are two white boys in their early 20s uh, involved with ACT UP. And the third character you'll meet is Floyd, who's a black activist in the group who's 15 to 20 years older than him. And right before this happens, there's a scene or, or the previous time you see Floyd in the book, he has kind of schooled a bunch of the younger white ACT UP activists about um, their sort of clumsy um, language and, and presumptions around doing outreach to uh, communities of color. So Floyd has schooled our, our narrator and this is the first time we're seeing him after that they run into him in the West Village at night and there's some small talk and then um, they offer to buy him a drink. Floyd steers us to the Ninth Circle, a bar we've never been to before. Inside it's sad and a little seedy. Floyd sits on a bar stool, legs crossed, smoking a cool and sipping a grasshopper. This has been my drink since I first came to New York. Oh, I used to have fun here, he says. In the 70s, this bar was the place. Did you come here after Stonewall, I asked? Child, I was at Stonewall. He's smiling now. The Stonewall wasn't much for fancy cocktails, though. You went there to dance. To this day, when I hear Aretha Franklin think, I go right back to that summer when we fought the police, all of us dancing with our hands in the air, singing freedom. People claim that Judy Garland's death set off the riot, I say. He shrugs. Judy was beloved, but I'm not sure she deserves credit for our rebellion. The harassment was constant, especially for us black brothers and sisters. You'd sit on a stoop with your friends enjoying a summer night and the police would tell you to move along, threaten to arrest you for loitering. But we didn't move along. We just put more asses on more stoops. You had to be on the streets if you wanted to claim the streets. They couldn't arrest everybody. 
As we exit the bar, he sits down on the stoop and gestures to us to do the same. Come on, children, feel it with me. Lounge. We sit and then lounge, spreading ourselves out like we own the steps. Floyd says, back then, you'd have your one pair of jeans. Just one? That's right, your second skin. You'd buy them shrink to fit. Put them on, step into the shower, and soak. Let them dry onto your body, and then you wear them till they were falling off. Today you all want new, 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 but back then you walked around with your history showing. Oh girl, I can see your history, I joke. That's right, read it and weep. He takes us on a tour pointing out bars that were open 20 years earlier and places where bars used to be and places where cruising happened that were now either desolate or gentrified. He points to the Oscar Wilde bookshop. Before we had a community center, you, you went here and asked your questions. What's the best happy hour? Where's the protest march beginning? What's the number for the VD clinic? Didn't matter who was working, they'd answer or they'd know who to ask. Walking us down Christopher Street, he says, a year after Stonewall, we marked it with what we called Christopher Street Liberation Day. That became Gay Freedom Day. Then someone decided to rename it Pride. As far as I'm concerned, that was the beginning of the end. The end of what, Derek asks. We were blown away by what we saw at the gay pride parade. Once you're celebrating pride instead of freedom, you're just saying, look at me. But freedom, just another word for nothing left to lose, I finish. Yes, child, that's right. The white woman who sang that song was half a dyke herself. She knew the score. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I know everyone is clapping. That was amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I hear you in my heart. <laughs> so Beth, you want to read a little piece? Yeah, I, I had something marked, but I just didn't know if we were running out of time or... Um, time. Okay, I can have two, two little right. two-minute excerpts yeah. here. Um, this is when uh, Edie goes back to her, uh, the warehouse that she's been living in uh, on Mission Street uh, late one night. The warehouse was unlocked, never a good sign. The entrance was a set of swinging glass doors, which made it look like a barely functioning business, a shabby, hard, a shabby hardware store or shady credit union. If it were left unlocked for even five minutes, someone would come wandering in off the street because the Art Fart Warehouse was known to the local street populace as a place where if you tried enough times, you were eventually bound to gain entry. There were so many variables with its unpredictable residents, including states of inebriation, relationship drama, or habitual spaciness, that it was a miracle the door ever got locked. You'd think caution would be rampant in a communal living space with all its bed hopping and disappearing peanut butter, but personal responsibility was a tough nut among warehouse dwellers. Because of, um, sorry, because of this, the place was being ripped off constantly when plenty of people were home. Bikes, records, stereo equipment, computers, and musical instruments were easy to snatch and pawn. I, on more than one occasion, had bought my own stuff back from Anthony at Eagle Loan, but sometimes I was too late and everything had already been sold. When my stereo got stolen in the middle of the day while I was sleeping, my refrain was, well, at least I don't have to worry about my stereo getting stolen anymore. That's when I got a padlock for my bedroom door. I hesitated at the threshold for a second. Something was off, it was raining. It was raining inside, but it wasn't raining outside. The front workspace was dark, which was strange because there was always a light burning somewhere and there was water falling from the ceiling. It smelled like rotting garbage sacks with occasional surges of something even more foul, human. I rushed back into the kitchen and there were my roommates Ed, Jen, Jake, Luke, Luke's girlfriend, Keisha, and the new British guy who had given everyone tattoos with a gun he made from an old Walkman. They sat in the red vinyl booth, a massive curved banquette that had been rescued from the, a diner and was patched with duct tape, holding umbrellas over their heads. A few tall votives burned on the table and no one was talking. They barely looked up when I ran in. You guys, what's happening? They immediately sprang to life like a switch had been flipped in on grubby animatronic dolls. Answers came spilling out from everyone. It's the pipes from up there, from the fucking hotel. It's fucking toilet water from junkies. It's shit water and shower water. It won't stop. I was rarely surprised by anything anymore, but I did want to know one thing. How can you guys just be sitting there while shit <laughs> is raining down on you? 
come out. I think that's very 2020. This is this is what. <laughs> it's just the shit is raining down on all of our heads right now. You know, listening to that reading, that I I went back to this nostalgia question because I started remembering the apartment that I was in when the it wasn't necessarily shit water, but it was some kind of foul, filthy water that came down. And I had a pang of nostalgia while you were reading. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that great to just be rained on in your own house? It, it, the nostalgia is that you survived it, right? Like, the be, you don't really want to be in the water anymore, but the fact that you lived through it and you got out the other side and you're okay, I think that allows it or something. But <laughs> yeah, yep. good point, good point. Yeah. So I think we're kind of out of time, aren't we? Um, 7.15, I think that's supposed to be our, our cutoff. Are there any words of, of farewell that people want to? <laughs> Everyone uh, can secretly unmute themselves if they really want to speak. <laughs> Beth, did you have something to say though? No, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sponsoring this and yes. thanks to Carl and, and read Alvin's book if you haven't read it yet and you just enjoyed this conversation because it really is, it manages to be so funny in such a bleak time. And I feel like don't we all we all need that right now. Well, I think that's what tonight was. I think this was so fun and it definitely, it took me away from our reality for an hour and 15 minutes. And I really appreciate the, the humor that has happened here tonight. And the audience, this has been the most lively audience that we've had for a presentation. So I appreciate you all too for chatting and keeping it going. And you may unmute yourself and say something if you'd like. Keep it cool. Don't yeah, make me, me mute you again. <laughs> anyone wants to turn on their videos and give a give a smiley face. Yeah, talk to us. Talk to like us. To, I love to see people. I miss I miss yeah. everyone. Thank you, Alvin and Beth and, and Anissa and Lisa for, for uh, yeah. this. I feel lucky to be on board. <laughs> there's some everybody waving. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jim Van Buskirk, there's Mr. Jim. He's going to be presenting um, at the end, the 25th, June 25th, um, pre-Stonewall. There was a pre-Stonewall. What? Come find out. <laughs> it's nice to see all you people. The library loves you and misses you. Thank you, library. Thank you, library. library. Thank you, library. And this is where it gets really weird, so... <laughs> we're done we're done, we're done. <laughs> just fire us all just fire us all just I'm gonna like, fire oh. you, but you will get an email from me and it'll be a wrap up and the video will be available eventually one more time with the link for everything we talked about which i just sent to lisa now let me send that to everybody <laughs> all right good night beautiful people